Praise the Lord. It's good to be here tonight again with Free Indeed Ministry to share the gospel of Christ that makes free indeed. Amen. Um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to be with us tonight. Lord, I ask you, Jesus, to just let your spirit fill this place, Lord, fill this vessel. Speak through me, Lord. Speak words of life, God, as only you can. I ask you, Lord, to bring your word together, Lord, and touch some soul tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Um, my heart's really heavy tonight. I, uh, it, it seems like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's, it, it just seems like everything I've been hearing lately, in a sense, in a sense, is a chastening. Um, and I say that in a sense, it's, in a way, it's a calling you know, to come near, to draw near, to draw near to God. But, but in a sense, also a chastening, if you're not there, to draw near. But the scripture says that the Lord chastens those he loves. And um, I was thinking a little bit about this message tonight, and I know um, that the... Um, you know, this is free indeed prison ministry. And uh, we, it is a prison ministry, but when the COVID hit, we began to, to do the live streaming <coughs> because we couldn't go into the prisons. And, and so it, I was thinking, well, Lord, you know, <coughs> I guess we're, you know, we're just preaching to the lost. But I was thinking this morning, you know, there's a whole world of lost people sitting on church pews. There's a whole world of lost people who don't even know they're lost. Um, just as there was in the days of Christ, there, there was a whole nation that didn't know that they were lost. <coughs> And they called themselves the people of God. And it's the same today. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, um, so I want to turn first off to Hebrews 12. And for time's sake, I'm, I'm just going to start at, at verse 12 or verse 11. But, but before that, it says, you know, the Lord chastens those he loves. So don't be discouraged if the Lord is chastening you. The Lord has been chastening me um, <clears throat> because he wants to draw us closer. He wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to be all that we can be for him and with him. Um, in verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let it rather be healed. There is coming a time, and, and it's, it's sooner than we think. There is coming a time that is sooner than we think that everything's going to come to an end. And that which is lame is going to be turned out of the way. But Jesus would rather it be healed. 
God would rather it be healed. He's giving us a time that it can be healed, and he's chastening and he's drawing to a time when it can be healed. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a, the gift of God. We all know by now that grace is that new heart that God gives us. It's the divine influence on the heart of man that is reflected in everything he does, including thankfulness. And by grace are you saved. And if you look that up, it also means healed. He says, let it rather be healed. Oh, that we would be so full of grace. Everything that God has for us. How? By faith. By faith. Um, <clears throat> in, and I just wanted to bring out these two scriptures in Luke 6 and 46. Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, if you're his people... Why aren't you doing what he says? This is a chastening. And then in Luke 12 and verse 26 and 27, he says, Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you, whence you are. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. There is coming a day very soon that the lame are going to be turned out of the way. That's what this is speaking of. But he says, let it rather be healed. Let it rather be healed. And this by grace. So I want to turn back just one chapter to chapter 11 here. <clears throat> Verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. And Sunday morning, uh, we had turned to this scripture, our pastor did, and he was, he was reading on to 13. But as soon as my eyes fell on this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. My mind went to this service tonight. Faith is the substance. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence. There is evidence in what you believe. It matters what you believe. Your faith is what you believe. Your faith is what you know. Your faith is what you are. Um, I, I looked up that word substance and it's essence. It's all the little things that make something what it is. Um, if I believe a tree is a brown trunk with bark and green leaves, you know, I, I know this. You can give me something that is soft and yellow and has purple fuzz on it and tell me it's a tree and I'm going to know it's not. There's evidence. Um, so what you believe, it matters. If you believe, and it says of things hoped for, and I thought, well, we can know what it is you want from God by what you are. <laughs> if you believe that he died to save you from hell, but not from sin, everybody's going to know it because you're still going to be a sinner. But it's not going to be the truth because his word doesn't say it. Because <clears throat> things hoped for, it has to be given. There has to be a reason to expect it, and God's word never says that. There has to be a reason for that hope. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
All that just to say, faith in Christ has evidence. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He came to make us free from sin. If your faith is in Christ that he died to make you free from sin, you will be free from sin. You will not be a sinner. And that's not because he don't see you as a sinner. It's because you will not have sin in you to do. You will not sin. I don't know any plainer way to say that. If he has made you free from sin, there is no sin inside of you to come out. Period. The very next verse there in Romans says, it's dead. And he that is dead cannot sin. And that is the proof. That is the proof. That is the evidence. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Now if you go on and read this whole scripture, it's talking about Abraham and, and all them that received a good report by faith. God would speak to them just like God told Abraham he would have a son. God told Abraham to leave his home and to take a journey. And, and Abraham believed God and he did what God said. And because Abraham believed God, because uh, Abel believed God, because Enoch and, and all of these, because Noah believed God, and there was proof that they believed God. They acted. Noah built the ark. Abraham walked. They did. They acted upon their faith. There was evidence there. And because of that, they received a good report. They were counted as righteous. But they never received the righteousness of God. They never received that new heart while they walked on this earth. Let's keep reading and we'll find, find out more. Verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He, he went. God told him, go and, and walk, and you'll inherit this land and physically. And he went and he walked, and they inherited that physical land. But they didn't put down roots there because they were looking for something more. They were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. They wasn't, they wasn't content with just a promise of something um, earthy. They were looking for something more. Verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. They were looking for a place where they could be where God wouldn't be ashamed to be called their God. Now, they received a good report, but there was more to be had. There was a place that they could be where God would not be ashamed to be called their God. Verse 39, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, 
received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. This word perfect, we've, we've looked at this before, but it's complete. This means having that new heart and that new spirit. That that they couldn't give themselves even though they acted on what God said because it wasn't available yet. It was not available until Christ came. And, and if you remember, Jesus told the disciples when they asked him, teach us how to pray. And he told them, he said, pray on this wise. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, sanctify your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth, just like it is in heaven. Make a place right here on earth where, where you're sanctified, where you're holy. Let your city come here on earth. And then he told others, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. And let's turn back to chapter 10. The first verse says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or complete. Law can never make us complete. Law can never give us a new heart. Law can never make us in God's righteousness. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And this even today. Even today, ministers stand up all the time saying, do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that. Having people offering sacrifices, repent and do this and do that, that will never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, set down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Jesus came to build that city, if you will, to, to uh, lay the foundation for that city, if you will. Um, in uh, one place it talks about us being built up as uh, living stones, lively stones. Uh, I wish I could remember where that was, but I can't remember right now. But, but it's a city. But if you can see it, it's not talking about a place physically, but a place spiritually. And, and they didn't receive it then, but I promise you they had it as soon as Jesus descended into hell and took the keys to death and hell and arose. Right along with everyone else who will receive it. There is a proof in true saving faith. It changes who you are. And it, that's, that's not even... I, I want the, This was on my heart, and I want this understood, but I want to go somewhere else tonight, too, because there's a reason. That if you're not 
If this isn't who you are, first off, you've got to be saved. First off, you've got to be saved. Your, your, you're dying. That, that's the only way I know to say it. You need to be healed. You need to be healed. You need that new heart and that new spirit of Christ within. Um, sin must be destroyed inside of you by faith in Christ. I want to turn now to Luke 19. starting at verse 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And I want you to see what's going on here. The Lord has come. Jesus has come and he's, he's fixing to be offered up, but he's, he's making an entrance into Jerusalem here. And, and they're glorifying him for the glorious things they've seen him do and, and believing that he's the Christ and, and they're praising him. And the Pharisees, the church people, those that are supposed to be, you know, the best of the best are telling them, tell them to be quiet. Tell them to quit saying these things. And, and Jesus tells them, if these hold their peace, the stones will cry out. And, and it just, when I read this, my thoughts went to, you know, how many people tell us to, to quit preaching the Christ. Quit, you know, just be quiet about it. it it's not important, and, and, but it is. It is important. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah that came to make an end of sins, and it will be declared. It will be declared. We will not be quiet about it. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. And I want you to kind of see this in conjunction with what we read in the beginning about the chastening of the Lord. The Lord chastens those he loves. And he says, you know, don't, don't deny the chastening, but receive it and lift up your head and, and receive it and, and, and let it do a work in you and let it be healed. And Jesus comes, and when he was come to, near the city, he, he weeps over it. And he says, If thou had known, even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation." I'm going to stop there just a second, but I'm coming back there. I just thought of a scripture this made me think of. Um, Who 
he's speaking to the Jews here. And he, he said, you know, these, these were those that called themselves the people of God. And he said, if you would have just realized who I was, that I am the Christ, that I came for you, if you would have just realized who I was. But now it's too late. And in Romans 3, it says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. And it just made me think, you know, if you're calling yourself a Christian, you have the Word of God. You have the Word of God. You have an advantage. You can get this Bible out and you can ask God to touch your heart and your mind to read this Word and give you understanding and save your soul. And he'll do it if you're sincere. If you're sincere, he will do it. You have an advantage. But if you refuse it, time is running out. I don't know why that it's just been so strong on my heart. It's like, it seems like in my mind, it seems like everybody's just kind of like, oh, well, you know, when somebody shoots a bomb off or something, then we'll, it may be too late then. It may be too late then. We can't wait until the end. Verse 45. And I've never understood this verse so much until just yesterday. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I'm going to turn to Isaiah 58. God told the children of Israel <clears throat> that if they would hear his voice indeed and obey, that they would be a peculiar people, a kingdom of priests. And uh, in one place it says, uh, I think when the promise went to to Abraham, that they would be a, bl a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And when I read that, that my father's house should be a house of prayer, I thought of that kingdom of priests, how the house of God is supposed to be a place full of people seeking God for the lost. Not a place ordering people about, not a place asking people for money, not a place uh, demanding of people 
but a go-between between God and the people. But he says, you've made it a den of thieves. Isaiah 58, verse 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yea, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They act like they're not doing anything wrong. They keep going to church and singing praises and acting like they're not doing anything wrong. They ask me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. They take delight in coming up to the altars and singing. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and they see us, thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his, set, his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shall thou call the Lord, shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou shalt take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in the drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise, rise up the fountains of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. That's what a priest should do. That's what a kingdom of priests should be. That's what the house of God should be full of. That's what a house of prayer will be. Not a den of thieves, but a repairer of the breach. A repairer of the breach. Bringing souls back to the Lord. Restoring that which was lost. Then should thy darkness be as noonday. And I'll finish with the scripture that Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. A, set, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Remember what they were looking for? They were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. That city 
Inside is the proof. That city inside where God rules, where God, how does it say, whose builder and maker is God. That city where God is not ashamed to be called their God. That city where the Lamb is the light. That city where he shines. That's what's inside of those whose faith is in Christ. Not in ourselves for anything. I was thinking today, just praying, and, and, uh, and I thought, Lord, I just want to worship you, but I can't even worship you without you. Ever, I have nothing to give him. Nothing. I can't even worship him without him. Everything. I love him because he loves me. I'm saved because he saved me. I praise him because he is my song. He is my life. He is the air I breathe. I'm alive because he is in me. He is my everything. Is he your faith today? And is the proof there? That's what's on my heart tonight. I, I pray that you could hear what was on my heart and that no matter where you are in Christ, if you're not in Christ, that you would receive him. To be in Christ means that Christ is in you. And if Christ is in you, then you cannot sin. So if you're a sinner, Christ is not in you. But you can be free. You can be free. So first things first. Be saved. <laughs> Receive Christ into your heart. And that's not just a matter of words. That's a, that's a very real occurrence. When Christ comes in, sin has to go out. And it's not there to come to be available for you anymore. It's gone. It's gone. But if you're free from sin, seek God for all he has for you. Time is short. Time is short. And um, we need to be that kingdom of priests. We need to be that city set on a hill that cannot be hid. We need to be that light of the world in these dark times. We need to be a blessing to the nations. We are the body of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.